I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today is another bank holiday in the United Kingdom, so while we're not doing live updates, we've gone back through our email postbag, which is overflowing with your questions. As always, thank you so much for getting in touch. We may only be able to respond to some of your emails, but we do try and read every single one. To answer your questions today, I'm joined by our podcast regulars, assistant comment editor Francis Sternley, and our associate editor for defence, Dom Nichols. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody is going to break us. We are strong. We are Ukrainians. Dom, can I start with you? This is a question from Colin. He says... One thing that seems to be missed when we talk about the upcoming offensive, this is the anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive, we hear about tanks and the ammunition in gun barrels, smooth or rifled, but what about the issue of mines? Ahead of the Ukrainians will be minefields for many kilometres. How do tanks deal with mines? Dom Nichols. Thanks, Colin. Tricky one. I mean, mines aren't good <laughs> at all for, for movement across any piece of ground. And so tanks don't deal with them themselves. They have other vehicles, engineer assets, basically, that are based on tank hulls that go and dig them up, shove them to one side. And as well as mines, these engineering assets cover gaps, rivers, they continue the motion. So the first thing that you do when you look at a piece of ground from a soldier's point of view is the engineers need to get involved to say, well, how am I going to safely cross that bit of ground? And it's just worth touching here on what's happening in Ukraine. So in January, we saw Germany announce it was going to send mine plows. These things will physically dig up buried pressure fused mines as in some mines go off by timing some go off by acoustic they hear a rumble of a tank but others go off by pressure as if you stand on them or you drive on them they will go off so that's a pressure fused mine so these mine plows will dig them up then in march germany also said it was going to be sending three pioneer panzer dax military engineering vehicles these are based on the leopard one chassis so all part of like say that engineering effort In March also, the US said as part of the $400 million package then that it's going to be sending M60 Armoured Vehicle Launch Bridge System, AVLB as they're known. As the name suggests, they are little bridges and they span a 60-foot gap to get across small rivers, gaps, etc., etc. And those are based on the old Patton tank. Now, like I say, for perspective, let's have a think about what minefields are and obstacles are and defenders can easily, very easily waste their time producing huge obstacles and fortifications that are either just driven around or climbed across. And they can pour millions of tons of concrete into tank traps and minefields, and they can lay dragon's teeth and barbed wire. They can have it covered by, or they should have every obstacle covered by surveillance and firepower. And all of that can be for naught if you don't lay it correctly. And like I say, for perspective, the Atlantic Wall on D-Day was breached in four hours. The Barlev line in the 1973 Yom Kippur War breached in two hours. And then in the 2003 Iraq War, the British Seven Armour Brigade went through the Iraqi lines of minefields, anti-tank ditches and wire in 46 minutes. So if you know what you're doing and the enemy don't when it comes to laying these obstacles, you can get past them. But yeah, so in and of themselves, mines not nice at all. But if you know where they are, you can drive around them. If they're not covered by fire, then that is not how you should employ them. And there are many, many assets, military assets from the engineering branches that can find them, dig them up, mark them, destroy them and do what have you. But mines generally, I mean, there are so many different types, it's difficult to say one size fits all because it simply doesn't. But they could do everything from just blowing off the tracks, the tank tracks, and then suddenly you, you can't go anywhere or they can breach the hull and kill everyone inside, or they can knock out the engine so you can't move. When it comes to tanks and armoured vehicles generally, we talk about M-kill and K-kill. M-kill means mobility kill, so the, the crew might survive, the gun could still be in action, the primary purpose for that vehicle could still be applicable. It just can't move anywhere, so it has very limited utility, but it, it can still shoot stuff. Or a K-kill... K doesn't sound for anything except kill. So kill, kill, I suppose, if you like. But that's when the thing's completely wiped out. You're not going to use it again and the crew are probably killed. So yeah, mines, very, very difficult to defeat if you're on top of them. Modern vehicles try to have V-shaped hulls to direct the 
pressure, the blast from a mine out the side. It might take off a wheel or two, it might take off some tracks, but the crew will survive and the vehicle could probably be recovered and used again. But actually, MRAPs, as they're called, mine resistance, ambush protected vehicles, this family, this fleet of vehicles, they are lighter vehicles, more infantry based because tanks really can't have a v-shaped hull just the physics doesn't really work like that they're big old lumbering beast tanks so they've got fairly flat hulls flat bottom to the hull and that does not work well with a mine so the idea is you just don't go near them you have the engineers that that identify the areas that are likely mined and deal with them and any other obstacles before you get anywhere near them thank you very much for that francis can i go to you let's zoom out this question comes from andre in maryland it's a very broad question how do you think this war will end Yeah, starting with a biggie. Well, in the first episode of the year, I summarised the strategic position as I saw it of both Ukraine and Russia. And I argued that we were in a war of attrition, a battle of patience and resources measured in manpower, morale and munitions. This for me remains true now. It is in the interest of neither side caught in a struggle for advantage to pursue negotiations because both are pursuing total victory, as they define it, or the strongest possible negotiating position until something fundamentally changes on the battlefield or in the political space. I don't foresee this war ending anytime soon. Now, these fundamental changes could take several forms. A hugely successful Ukrainian counteroffensive and subsequent Russian collapse, for instance, or a serious crack in Western support for Ukraine, which seeks to force Ukraine to agree to a ceasefire. At this stage, either is still possible. But let's assume for a moment that Ukraine is as successful as many believe it's capable of. That still doesn't mean that the Russian army will just implode, they'll be forced to leave Crimea by high mass strikes and we all cry victory. It's at that stage that the nuclear rhetoric is bound to be ramped up and that's the serious test, one that I'm not convinced the West will pass at this stage. To me, caught between risking World War III and letting Russia keep Crimea, many Western countries quite possibly with China's backing, would be willing to cede Crimea and possibly the annexed territories. That's despite the fact that if Putin loses Crimea, he likely loses his crown. A collapsing nuclear-armed Russia will be perceived as extremely dangerous by many in the international community, so much so they might be wanting to avoid that at all costs. And we could find ourselves in a situation where some Western leaders would actually support Putin rather than a perceived less rational actor. And that's why, in in my view, though I'm not saying this is the most likely outcome regarding the endgame, a longer attritional war on two fronts remains essential. Paradoxically, a decisive Ukrainian victory could prove fatal for Ukraine because the panic amongst the West could lead to a forced compromise. Thus far, we've had one attritional war on the battlefield, but not enough is being done on the second for me. And that's the economic war against Russia. The failures of the West to isolate Russia and stopped its allies rallying to it, especially China, could still prove the fatal chink in the armour. For unless the country itself bleeds severely in the domestic and economic sphere, I cannot foresee the Russian public growing tired of this war and wanting it stopped in the short term. Neither can I see Putin changing gears. I just hope the moment hasn't been lost. But if it hasn't and Russia bleeds on the battlefield and severely economically, then I think there is still a way for a total Ukrainian victory as they define it. But it's a narrow path as things stand. Crucially, however, sometimes holding on is a victory in and of itself. If Putin were to keel over tomorrow or be assassinated by someone, then everything would suddenly change. And those now calling for peace would look extremely foolish indeed. So there's that to consider. And just one last thought on this. Kissinger is right to say that if an armistice were agreed tomorrow, then it would still, relatively speaking, from where we were when the war began, be an enormous Western and Ukrainian success. Putin sought to decapitate the Ukrainian leadership and seize at least half, if not the whole country. He has failed fundamentally in that and has broadly united Europe and the West against him. He claimed he wanted to stop NATO encroachment, but it's led to the expansion of NATO with Finland joining and Sweden set to do so. But where I would profoundly disagree with Kissinger, and it's worth bearing this always at the forefront of our minds, 
is that if that's truly what we use to define our definition of victory, Putin invading a sovereign nation and able to keep some territory by force, I wonder whether that can truly qualify as a success for Western values and for Ukraine and whether it really lays the groundwork for a lasting peace. It would be for history to judge, but I fear it wouldn't judge it kindly. Thank you very much, Francis, and thank you, Andre, for the question. Don, back to you. This question comes from Mike. He says, why would Ukraine try and kill Putin? They may replace him with somebody competent with good decision-making skills. I'm sure you can hear maybe the slight edge of sarcasm in that question. So would you like to just talk about maybe Putin's strategic thinking, his decision-making over the last year or longer? Yeah, thanks, Mike. I I think you've answered your own question there. You've identified if Putin were to go, who knows what would come next? There are suggestions there'd be someone more brutal, although you know, it's difficult to see that really. But quite what would come next, we don't know. And you shake that particular snow dome if you're a national leader at war after very cautious evaluation. So, yes, I don't think Ukraine are actively trying to kill Putin, this drone strike on the Kremlin. I mean, it wouldn't. <laughs> You'd have to be exceptionally unlucky. I think it'd have to land on you, I think, for it to kill you because the blast was up on the roof. So I don't think that was... Uh, it's just ridiculous to say that was an assassination attempt, if anything. And we don't know who did it. But if it was not a false flag, then it was more of a demonstration of capability than anything with military effect. But Putin... Well, you know, His decision-making over the last 20-odd years, bar the last year, has been exceptionally consistent. He's never tried to hide the fact that he thought that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a historical mistake. And he thought that Russia had been humiliated and he pinned that blame on the West. Now, I think Russia was humiliated, but not by the West. I think it was largely humiliated by its own actions and by the, in the in the 90s, the, the rise of the oligarch class and this rush for people to grab what they could and make what they can out of a collapsing state. I think that's done fundamental damage to society. And there's now a very much a Hobbesian view in Russian society that people just survive for themselves, take what they can. I don't think it's a very nice place to live, quite frankly. But for whatever reason, Putin took that mindset. And I am told by members of our security community, intelligence community, that one of the fundamental formative experiences of Putin's life was when he was a serving KGB officer in Germany at the time, we think Dresden, but I think there's also reports he was in Berlin. But anyway, it matters not. He was in Germany when the war fell in 1989, when KGB in Berlin was sending messages back to Moscow centre, back to Moscow saying, what do we do? What do we do? What's happening? This is what's happening on the ground here. What action do I take? And I'm told that the utter absence of any direction and leadership and information, this void, this vacuum in Moscow, played on Putin's mind. And eventually he got out with his wife and we're told his fridge was very important to him. I don't know how true that bit is. But we were told that since he gained power, political power, he's always made a thing about saying there will never be an empty line from Moscow there will always be direction. There will always be an answer. There will always be leadership. We're in charge. Moscow is all powerful. There will never be the void at the end of the line again. And so it's all been about strength and it's all been about radiating out from Moscow this big, impenetrable fortress. I'm being deliberately disingenuous because of the drone attack. But this idea that Moscow is all seeing, all knowing, it's powerful, it's the steady hand on the tiller. That is what he's been about. He has sensed in the West, a weakness, and he senses that we were too decadent, that we were too interested in in ourselves and making money and being frivolous with society and gender, law and God knows what else, and he sensed an opportunity. And tellingly, this started very early on. The first message that George W. Bush received after 9-11, on the day of 9-11, from an overseas leader, was from Vladimir Putin who said, we're with you, we support you, or, or words to that effect. I, don't, you know, I paraphrase the actual message. But very, very quickly, Putin saw that this was an easy win for him. He came out of the blocks quickly and said to Bush, you know, we're on your side. And that was a masterstroke, really, because it sort of hoodwinked, I think, hoodwinked America to what was actually happening in Russia. He then had the whole reset. You remember that those images of Hillary Clinton and Sergei Lavrov and that ridiculous model of a big red button that they were they said reset on the side, pressing the reset on the relationship. I mean, Lavrov was smiling and quite genuinely so. He must have been laughing inside thinking, you guys, you just don't see it, do you? 
Anyway, so the end of history, Dom. It's the end of the end of history. I mean, yeah, you got to lay Fukuyama on there as well. It's all done. So I think Putin sniffed a vulnerability in the West. He tried his luck in 2008 in Georgia and nothing happened from the West. So, oh, OK, here we go. Six years later, 2014, east of Ukraine and Crimea did it again and not a lot coming back the other way. So I think he's been very consistent in his worldview. And I think actually the West has been pretty consistent in a fairly limp response. So up to last year, he thought that, that he was in the pound seats and he could chance his arm in the rest of Ukraine and there wouldn't be much coming back the other way and I think he was surprised I think everyone's been surprised except possibly the Ukrainian people at how stout their resistance has been I've been very surprised at how resolute the Western community has been over this after some faltering starts it has to be said and there's still some people at the back dragging their heels over certain issues but I've been amazed at how coherent the external support has been for Ukraine so why would uh, Ukraine want to kill him now, try and assassinate him? I don't know. He's now in a hole of his own making. The veil has been lifted. We can actually see what Russia's like, what he's like. We can see the threat. Why, whether or not the Western world now do something about it is an entirely different question, which you can ask next time, Mike. Thank you, Dom. Back to you, Francis. We've had this question a few times, but Raquel uh, in Spain has sent this in. She asks, were the Ukrainians betrayed by the West at the Budapest Memorandum? So I think maybe just explain for us what that actually was. (laughs) Well, yeah, what a question. So yes, for listeners who aren't aware, the Budapest Memorandum is the political agreement signed in 1994 between Ukraine, the US, Russia and the UK, which ensured Ukraine's territorial integrity in exchange for giving up its nuclear weapons. Now, this memorandum has been controversial as it's really unclear for many in Ukraine what legal obligations the signatories had to defend the country in the event of aggression. For many Ukrainians, they feel they were betrayed by the Western powers when Russia annexed Crimea. Many believe, rightly or wrongly, that the UK, the US, had an obligation to come to their aid following the Russian annexation. Likewise, they think that giving up nuclear weapons was a mistake that left Ukraine naked to the danger of Russian aggression. Now, taking that last point first, many would argue that Ukraine didn't really have the necessary storage and security abilities in the mid-90s to retain those weapons on their soil. And if so, then I think the idea they could have retained them is possibly historical back projection. But the suggestion of betrayal regarding the security guarantees is more complex. Now, in brief, it's commonly said that the US and the UK, as well as as Russia, of course, provided security guarantees, crucial word, to Ukraine, which were later disregarded. I think this is likely a mistake if you look at the wording. Now, Article 2 of the Moren Random says that the three states provide security assurances, not guarantees. And that difference is crucial. To guarantee a state means to undertake to defend it if it's attacked by another state. So, for example, of course, from history, Britain guarantees Belgium in 1839 and Poland in 1939. Both of these guarantees led to the world wars because Britain was obliged by the guarantees to enter the wars to defend those countries, even though Britain hadn't been attacked itself at the time of entry. By contrast, a security assurance means that the assuring state must not attack the assured state. Thus, the US, the UK and Russia simply agreed to not attack Ukraine at the Budapest Memorandum. They did not agree to defend Ukraine from an attack by another state. Thus, by that understanding, the US and the UK did not break their promises in the Budapest Memorandum, but Russia, of course, did. Now, I know this goes against many Ukrainians' understandings of the memorandum, but this is my understanding of the reality of the matter by reading into it. So to answer that question in simple terms, no, I don't believe that Ukraine was betrayed by the West, but it was certainly betrayed by Russia. Just staying around this theme, Francis, can I stay with you? Tyrone in Hawaii, thank you, Tyrone, for sending this question. And again, we're going quite broad and uh, conceptual here, but he asks... How could this war have been avoided? Well, very briefly, in the long term, by being much harder against Russia in the decades of Putin's rule prior to, but especially after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. And I would argue in the short term, certain powers, perhaps even NATO peacekeepers, at Ukraine's request, stationing troops in Ukraine. 
I do not believe that sending the Ukrainians considerably more weapons in the last year before the invasion would have made as much of a difference as some do, such as the arrogance of the Russian military. I think they would have dismissed the effectiveness and the will of the Ukrainians to fight even if they'd had those weapons. But I do think that much, much more could have been done. And perhaps just having a few hundred Western soldiers in the ground may well have been enough. That'd be one for historians to debate, David. Thanks, Francis. Back to you, Dom. Anders from Norway has sent a question. He asks, both the recent and many other Russian attacks involve the use of strategic bombers like the Tu-95 and the Tu-160. Is there any way for Ukraine to counter this threat? Yeah, so the big Tupolevs, these are the big strategic bombers. What they've been doing is they never leave Russian airspace. They get nowhere near Ukrainian airspace. They are launching their cruise missiles, the main thing they're launching, well, well, well inside Russian airspace. So in terms of going after the aircraft themselves, it is exceptionally difficult. The strikes that we saw last week from the Tupolevs, some of them came from Mamansk. I mean, that's right up inside the Arctic Circle. So it's exceptionally difficult to stop those planes taking off. Now, there have been some blasts on Russian airfields that, you know, we don't know. Is it Ukrainian special forces? Is it partisan activity? Are the Ukrainian partisans spirited into Russia or Russian partisans? We don't know. But there have been some blasts on Russian airfields, but they haven't really. The drone attack that we saw from Belarus when it actually landed hit the Russian bomber in Belarus. That's the most effective we've seen. So it's very difficult to stop these things taking off. Now, Ukraine does have weapons that they can use against these bombers, but it's very difficult to get those weapons within the range of the Tupolevs. It's very difficult to get weapons that have the accuracy to hit them. Plus, of course, there is the political issue of taking that fight so far inside Russia. Like it or not, that is a thing. That is a political consideration that has to be addressed. I think the way to tackle this threat, remembering, of course, that threat is capability times opportunity times intent. They know they've got the intent. We know they've got the capability in terms of the weapons, the aircraft and the missiles. So the opportunity is the only thing that Ukraine can really impact. And so if they can't go after the planes, then they have to have an effective layered air defence network in order that they can deal with the missiles that come off the rails. It's difficult to build up these stocks of these precision guided munitions and cruise missiles. And actually, once they've run out, then you can have as many Tupolev 160s set on the ground as you like. They haven't got the missiles to fire, then you've nullified the threat. And I think that's the reason why Ukraine, or one of the reasons why Ukraine has prioritised air defence to such a great degree in recent months. Initially, it was tanks, and then it's moved on to air defence in order partly to protect the civilian areas and protect the civil infrastructure, the energy networks and the grids, but also to stop these missile strikes in and of themselves. Because if they are nullified, then... Like I say, it doesn't matter how many Tupolev 95 and 160 you got. If the missiles aren't getting through, then Russia is not going to have the effect that they want. Thanks, Tom. This next question comes from Otto in Germany, and it actually touches on something, Francis. You and I have discussed this at length, haven't we, over, over several evenings. So thank you very much, Otto, for asking this. Otto writes, You talk about Crimea a lot, but we've never done a deep dive into the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856. What is the significance of that war for the conflict in Ukraine today? Well, David, as you say, I've been champing at the bit to talk about this. So I'm pleased to have the opportunity to do so in this Q&A. In doing so, I'm borrowing heavily from Orlando Figes' excellent book, Crimea, which was published in 2010 and was remarkably prescient. Take this quote, for instance, which has echoes of the war in Ukraine today. For the British and the French, the Crimean War was a crusade for the defence of liberty and European civilization against the barbaric and despotic menace of Russia, whose aggressive expansionism represented a real threat, not just to the West, but to the whole of Christendom. As for the Tsar, the man more than anyone responsible for the Crimean War, he was partly driven by inflated pride and arrogance, a result of having been Tsar for 27 years, partly by his sense of how a great power such as Russia should behave towards its weaker neighbours, and partly by a gross miscalculation about how the other powers would respond to his actions. But above all, he believed he was fighting a religious war, a crusade to fulfil Russia's mission. Golly. 
So what was the Crimean War? Well, in short, it was a conflict fought between Russia and an alliance of France, Britain and the Ottoman Empire from, as you say, 1853 to 1856. The war primarily took place on the Crimean Peninsula and its causes include a cocktail of religious disputes, territorial ambitions and a competition for influence in the region. The war resulted in a victory for the alliance and for many historians, marks the moment of the real decline of the Russian Empire after its immense power, really, after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Now, Fides is particularly good on the impact of defeat in the war on Russia, and I'll quote from him again. Quote, the war played a significant role in shaping national identity, but that role was contradictory. The war was, of course, experienced as a terrible humiliation, inflaming profound feelings of resentment against the West for siding with the Turks. But it also fueled a sense of national pride in the defenders of Sevastopol, a feeling that the sacrifices they made and the Christian motives for which they had fought had turned their defeat into a moral victory. Now, Sebastopol is really interesting. Leo Tolstoy was there and wrote what we now know as the Sebastopol sketches, and it lionises the defenders in the way that Fiji's describes and is a really interesting book for understanding Russian attitudes to Crimea, which I would recommend listeners reading. I first read it when I was at university at the time of the invasion of Crimea, and it it really stuck with me. But Fiji's is also keen to point out that Tolstoy's conception of the war against Napoleon as this moment of Russia's national awakening. Of course, listeners will be very familiar with War and Peace and this idea of the rediscovery of Russian principles by the Europeanized nobility and the recognition of the patriotic spirit of the soldiers as the basis of its nationhood was really when, given the timing that Tolstoy was writing this, he was writing about an event that had taken place many decades before, it was actually a reflection of his reaction to the heroic deeds of the Russian people during the Crimean War. So it's hugely important in defining Russia's cultural understanding of itself. Liberals could admire Crimea because it was a people's war, one where the soldiers' experience was recorded and heroised, whereas conservatives could look at it as a holy war, the fulfilment of Russia's divine mission to defend orthodoxy in the wider world. So hugely interesting. One final point, and this is where I think the book predicts the disasters to come. Faisi discusses how Russian nationalists today have actively campaigned for Crimea to return to Russia. And he says... Memories of the Crimean War continue to stir profound feelings of Russian pride and resentment of the West. In 2006, a conference on the Crimean War was organised by the Centre of National Glory of Russia with the support of Putin's presidential administration and the Ministries of Education and Defence. The conclusion of the conference was that the war should be seen not as a defeat for Russia, but as a moral and religious victory, a national act of sacrifice in a just war. Russians could honour the authoritarian example of Nicholas I, a czar unfairly derided by the liberal intelligentsia for standing up against the West in the defence of his country's interests. The reputation of Nicholas I, the man who led the Russians into the Crimean War against the world, has been restored in Putin's Russia. Today, on Putin's orders, Nicholas's portrait hangs in the antechamber of the presidential office in the Kremlin. So yes, the Crimean War of the 19th century, very, very relevant and significant for understanding this one, David. I would argue it erected the cultural architecture which Russia has used ever since to justify its stance on the West and its leadership's imperialist impulses. Well, thank you, Francis. And thank you very much, Otto, for sending in that question. I've just got two questions of my own for both of you, just to finish this special Q&A episode of Ukraine The Latest. Just thinking back over the last few months to the beginning of January, we've interviewed and heard from countless people, eyewitnesses, experts from Ukraine and elsewhere. I just wanted to ask you both, which interviews, which stories have really stuck with you over the past few months? And what would you encourage if listeners haven't heard these episodes? What would you encourage them to go and listen to? Well, it will be a bit of a cop-out, but I'm not going to be able to narrow down any specific story, person or organisation. But what I would highlight is the resilience that we have heard day after day and the humanity that's still very much in evidence. There are times when we get particularly gloomy. There are times when we have people on who are going through some of the worst times of their lives. And yet through it all, people are able to see beyond the immediate trauma and they are able to keep going 
and in the vast majority of cases, not only look after themselves and keep going, but reach out to others. We've seen people producing prosthetic limbs. We've seen people listening. We've seen people creating, baking, making things, reaching out, asking how, how they can help. And not just the people we've interviewed, but also the many, many, many emails and messages we've been receiving as well. People are, are asking us how they can help, where they can learn more, where should they put their efforts. It has been a huge display and a very humbling and warming display of humanity in the face of extreme provocation and aggression, when it would have been understandable and entirely forgivable for people to retreat into themselves and just want it all to go away, don't want to hear about it, don't want to engage with it, don't want to learn about it. I just want to look after me and mine and the cl those closest to me. Yeah, an understandable, forgivable position to take. But we've not seen that. It, it's very much the opposite. People have reached out. People have gone out. They've sought information, good and bad. They've reached out to people. And I think that's been incredibly impressive and very humbling. Thank you very much, Tom. Francis Stanley. Well, I would echo all of that. I've lost count of the number of times I've been profoundly moved by the resilience of, of course, our Ukrainian guests, but also guests from around the world who have just been absolutely inspiring. Of recent guests, I was very struck by the work of The Reckoning Project in teaching journalists how to record testimony of war crimes. I'm very interested in this, obviously, because I've been talking about it so extensively on the podcast, the kidnapping of children, but also because as a historian by training, I am very interested in the recording of memory. And I think this is very interesting to see. It's not just the recording of testimony and memory. It's about recording something for posterity, but also for legal reasons, for trying to bring the people who've done these egregious acts to justice. And that's something quite different and quite interesting for me. Of course, there have been so many other guests, I can't name them all. Um, Edward Stringer, fascinating guest. Of course, Aliona, who's familiar to listeners, just always so insightful and interesting. But I also do think it's important as well just to thank our listeners. I mean, it's just been extraordinary the amount of feedback we've received from you. And it's a continual source of frustration, I think, for all of us that we can't answer all of you individually. But we really do mean it when we say that we read every message and quite often we discuss it. We feed it into the questions that we ask each other and we ask our guests. And some of the stories that you've told us are just, as I say, completely inspiring and moving. And so it's been the privilege of certainly my career to be engaging with you. And so thank you all very, very much for what you've done and continue to do. Thank you, Francis. I would just add to that. When I was thinking of this question, I was looking through the list of guests and journalists who've appeared in the podcast this year, because unfortunately, this has gone on so long, that there are now two separate decks that I have to sort of look at and, and follow. And I just want to turn the, the spotlight very quickly on The Telegraph's own journalists. I mean, the sheer amount of support we've had from our colleagues across the newsroom, whether it's from the foreign desks, so Sofia Yen, Natalia Vasilieva, James Kilner, Roland Oliphant is out in Ukraine at the moment. The names go on, Daniel Sheridan on the defence desk with Dom, Joe Barnes, who in Brussels, is always more than happy to jump on and, and share his reporting. We've had so much support from the freelance network who work with The Telegraph, uh, Colin Freeman, for example. I mean, there's no way I could name every single one. Listeners will be very, very familiar with all of their names and all of their reporting. And just a quick shout out, I would say also to my own team, to the social media team here at The Telegraph, who, if you listen live on Twitter, are the ones producing in the background, making sure that any technical fault or issue is addressed who are silently doing some fantastic and absolutely essential work. I think listeners will certainly appreciate the amount of effort that's been put in by the different desks around the Telegraph. I don't think there's a single desk of journalists here from business to foreign to, to wherever, to sports, and you name it, that I haven't at some point you know, gone over halfway through the morning and said, this is interesting, do you want to talk about this, talk about this? Oh, it starts at one, you know, come join us. So I'd say from my part, thank you so much to all of our wonderful colleagues for doing so much and helping so much. And just to add on to that, of course, we have to thank our wonderful producers here, Louisa Wells, the head of podcasts and senior producer, Giles Gear, who spend every day working on this podcast with us, recording the interviews we do, recording and editing the podcast as it goes out live to something which is sort of coherent by about five o'clock. So a huge thank you to Giles and Louisa. We just wanted to say that because it's important, of course, to recognise the input, but also just to give listeners a sense of just how much effort has gone into this and how much work and some of the best work I'd echo Francis 
crisis and say, you know, it's in a kind of odd and depressing way being the highlight of my career so far to do this. So thank you to all of the journalists and producers who have helped us. Francis and Dom, do you have any final thoughts for today? I would just say, David, thank you as well for all of your <laughs> masterful moderating. Uh, it's not an easy role what you do. And I, I should say as well for listeners that David is often the architect of arranging the guests and liaising with people. These things take time to arrange. And so it's not just sort of David doing it on the day, but it's the, all of that preparation that's involved in it beforehand. He doesn't know I'm planning on saying this, so uh, he's looking at me rather sheepishly. But thank you. And I know that the listeners, it's never the, quite the same when they don't hear I'm David Knowles and this is Ukraine the latest when Dom and I step in. So just thank you on their behalf. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Francis Durnley, Dom Nichols, thank you for all of your questions and have a very good afternoon. Goodbye. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload, So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gere. 